do more and more, there's always the threat of the net choking on its own traffic. Well, fortunately, the science of photonics promises to speed up the net, in fact, speed it up a lot, by using light to send information rather than tiny little electrons. Dr. Paul Willis takes a ride at the speed of light on the information superhighway. There are ambitious plans to give Australia a bigger and faster internet. The single largest infrastructure decision in Australia's history. If Mr Rudd's plans are realised, we'll have the best internet connections in the world. The new network will connect 90% of homes, schools and workplaces with optical fibre. But there are some serious hurdles between future plans and current realities. Bandwidth has been doubling every year or so. We have to upgrade the networks to keep up with this bandwidth demand. There are also energy concerns. Based on today's projections, literally in the next decade, we will be consuming 50% of the energy will be in the internet. Like any network, the internet has its limits, and we're rapidly approaching the operational capacity of the internet as we know it. These guys are working to avoid a worldwide crunch. They're part of a multi-institutional center of excellence called KUDOS. KUDOS brings together Australia's top scientists working in optical physics and photonics. And they've identified this as the problem in the system. Well, this is a router that you've probably seen before, and it's clearly based on electronics. The internet consists of countless kilometres of optic fibre cable connected up by electronic routers. But being electronic, the routers work at much slower speeds than the optic cables. And electronics simply can't keep up with the speed of the information in the optical fibre. That's the bottleneck, and that's the real issue that our research is, is dealing with. Conversely, photons travelling along optic fibres can't be made to do the fancy tricks that result in switching and routing. That's why the nodes of the internet are still slow-speed electronics. Why go to the trouble of converting the signal into an electronic signal if you can keep that signal in the photonic domain? And there's another problem. Every time you search on the internet, you produce about 0.2 grams of carbon. It doesn't sound like much, but if you do 35 searches like that, you produce the carbon equivalent of making a cup of tea. Multiply that kind of energy use by the number of people on the net, and very quickly, powering the internet becomes a major energy consumer. We really are heading headlong into a crunch, an energy crunch, in terms of the amount of energy that these, these, these routers consume. So not only must the internet get faster, it has to do it by using less energy. It seems like an impossible request. This looks like the answer. It's a photonic chip, a router that works not with electricity and electrons, but with photons of light. This is the future of the internet. It's the future of optical physics and photonics in general. This technology is going to change the world in a number of ways. So, how does it work? Well, to understand that, you need to know the concept of optical nonlinearity. Take this cello, for instance. If I bow a string gently, I get a soft, pure note. But if I hit the same string really hard, I get distortion. That is a non-linearity. I've overloaded the string, it feeds back into the system and creates noise. Optical non-linearity is the same idea, but with light in optic fibres. If you put a normal light into an optic fibre, it travels through without a problem. But if you pump in a high-intensity light, it can actually change the properties of the optic fibre and therefore change the way that other light moves along it. We can harness that nonlinearity to do switching on a time scale that's much faster than electronics offers. Remember, the reason we still use electronic routers is that electrons can be forced through devices such as transistors that will allow switching and routing of signals. 
Until now, that's something we couldn't get photons to do. You might remember from high school physics that electrons can interact with other electrons. It's this interactivity that allowed the development of the transistor, where the behaviour of one set of electrons determined the behaviour of another set. Photons don't interact with each other. They pass right through one another, so you can't make a photonic transistor. But by exploiting optical non-linearity, that's exactly what the Kudos team have done with the photonic chip. Another light beam is now affected by the change in the material. So I can switch one light beam with another light beam, and that's really the key concept. Transistors in electronic circuits allow the switching functions that make routers possible. The photonic chip replaces all these transistors and operates at least a thousand times faster. Making these wonder chips starts with a very special kind of glass. It contains the chalcogen elements, and there are three of those, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium. When we put very bright light into this glass, the light actually is slowed up a little bit, and that is a manifestation of the non-linearity. We have to, first of all, turn this lump of glass into a thin film. We then have to pattern the film of glass to make some kind of structure so that traps the light, takes it through the optical circuit. And it's the drawing of these very fine patterns that is at the heart of the chip production process. This machine is an electron beam uh, writer system and it's basically a system that allows us to create very small patterns on devices down potentially to the size of about one ten thousandth of the diameter of a human hair. So what we have here is an electron beam and we actually deflect that around under the control of the software here. So we take it out of the machine, dip it in some solvents and then develop out the pattern that we've just exposed. The chips are made in Canberra and sent to Sydney for testing. So Paul, we're looking through the microscope at the photonic chip here and at the moment we're interrogating the device in our terabit per second test bit. So you're just checking the performance here and your test bed's actually over here. That's right. This is the Kudos terabit per second test bed. It's the only one in Australia and one of only... What all this fancy gadgetry does is generate a photonic signal at a billion cycles per second, which is sent through the photonic chip and caught on a second device that slows the signal down to a million cycles per second so that the electronic circuitry can analyse it. That's stepping up and down the speed of the signal by a factor of a thousand. And, uh, so you've got the internet of tomorrow sitting on your desk. That's right. <laughs> We're talking to a hundred or a thousand times increase in speed. We've already demonstrated a terabit per second. Uh, in principle, we have another factor of ten available to us, and uh, that's uh, offering truly a thousand times increase in the capacity of today's networks. Not only do you save a lot of time by not converting photonic to electronic information and back again, photons can whiz around the new circuits much faster than electrons ever could. But what about the energy cost? From our perspective, uh, the situation is, is clear. We're just, we just want to reduce the, the operating power, make it uh, work at, at as low power as we can. The projections are that the chips will process a lot more data for a lot less energy. But wait a minute. If, like me, you've taken a step back from the magical embrace of all this wonderful technology, you have to ask yourself, do we really need a more powerful World Wide Web? Most internet users today wouldn't really benefit from being any faster. So are there new applications that would demand a faster, more powerful internet? Well, actually, there are. This is the business meeting like of the future. This, this is video conferencing on steroids. This is what you have in a business environment when you may be wanting to have a teleconference with someone in New York, someone in uh, Mumbai, someone in, in London. Yeah, look. It really feels like Carl is sitting in the same room, even though he's on the other side of the city. But this does chew up an awful lot of bandwidth. On the other hand, meeting online saves airfares and greenhouse gas. On an annualised basis, around uh, about 5 million tonnes of CO2 
per year could be saved. What you find is that... And real-time worldwide video conferencing could be extended into all kinds of areas. A surgeon in London could conduct surgery on a patient in Sydney. Or a hologram of a lecturer in Harvard could hold a seminar with hundreds or thousands of students around the world at one time. And soon, your whole house could go online. Visitor and front door. Glenn? Yes. Well, nice to meet you. Come in, thank you. Glenn has wired his whole house so that he can keep tabs on its climate and security remotely. The house continually monitors comfort levels and automatically adjusts them, all the while sending Glenn little messages to keep him in the loop. Each day, the house with all of the sensors generates about a million messages. Once again, the online house is hungry for bandwidth and puts more demands on the World Wide Web. Feels like this. The more people using the internet, the more bandwidth we will need. So, when are we going to see these wonder chips deployed across the internet? It's not going to be 10 years away. It's going to be probably a lot sooner than we think. Ultra-high-speed broadband is just a beginning for the photonic chip. While it'll never replace all of the circuitry in your computer, the potential future applications are just astounding. We are pursuing a number of very exciting applications, including defence applications, technologies, applications in the health sciences. So it really is only just the beginning.